My name is Don Thomas. I'm a former NASA astronaut, and I had the amazing opportunity to fly on four space shuttle missions. I've spent 44 days in space, and during that time, I went around the Earth 692 times. My highlights, uh, I flew in space four times, and uh, three of those were on Space Shuttle Columbia, one was on Discovery, and I was an astronaut for 17 years, but I only spent 44 days in space. So most of the time is spent training, preparing for the mission, but it's all, all of that is so much fun. We had a great time training. They say the only thing better than training is actually flying the mission. And so the highlights for me would be, you know, four times into space. They train us for everything and we try to simulate everything, zero gravity, and we train on how to operate the food station and, and we know what all the switches and the computers do. They train us on everything. One of the astronauts on my crew came up to me. Um, she was a rookie, hadn't flown before. And she came up to me and she had her mouth full of toothpaste and she's holding her toothbrush. And she says to me, what do I do with this? She's saying, what do I do with this? We don't have a sink like you would use at home to spit out your toothpaste. You know, here she had trained for four years for this flight. She was one of our top jet fighter pilots, knew all about flying the shuttle. But this one little thing, how do you brush your teeth, had fallen through the cracks. So I, I explained to her, we well, have two options. You know, m most of the time you just swallow it, get a drink of water and swallow that. She didn't like that option. The second option, they give us one clean towel a day and uh, you could spit into that and then you have a nasty towel. So she didn't like either option, but it just is kind of funny. Every now and then there's something very, very small like that, almost silly, that we didn't get trained on. But for the most part, you're, you're ready to go. We're really fully trained. I also spent about 30 or 40 hours training on looking at the Earth. They would show us pictures of what the Earth looks like from space. So I thought, I know what it's gonna look like, but when I got to the window on my first flight and I looked out and saw the Earth, I just went, oh, you gasp, because they, they couldn't prepare me for that. How beautiful the Earth is when you see it with your own eye instead of a photograph, there's no way to prepare somebody. And the first time any astronaut looks out the window, you'll hear that gasp. And what struck me that first time I saw it was seeing the little thin blue line going around the Earth, which is our atmosphere. Here on Earth on a sunny day, we look up at that blue sky and it looks like it goes on forever and ever. From space, we're seeing it edge on and it looks just like a paper thin layer and it's glowing blue, like a blue fluorescent light. And right up against that blue atmosphere is the blackness of space. And it was a darker black color than I'd ever seen before. You know, I've been caving and we shut off our lights and that should be pitch black, but this was even darker than that. And the contrast between that pitch black sky and that glowing layer of atmosphere, you know, blue line around the planet, is just striking and takes your breath away. On my first mission, I got to space and uh, a few hours later, I started having a little stomach awareness, we call it, like a, an upset stomach. And about a third of the astronauts will get a little um, sick from that. We call it space sickness. And it's just like seasick, car sick, air sick, but it's unrelated. If you get car sick or air sick on Earth, you could be fine in space. And nobody knows how, how you're gonna do until you get up there. So on my first mission, I had a little stomach upset. I didn't wanna eat anything the first day. I didn't throw up, but I thought, I'm close to that. I didn't want to try eating anything. The next morning, I woke up and I felt fine. In all subsequent missions, my third, fourth mission, as soon as I got to space, I felt fine. But I've been up there with people that were so sick, they couldn't do any useful work. You know, they would just be kind of floating there. And if that happens to somebody, and it happens every now and then, the rest of us just pitch in. What are you working on? Let me help you get them a cold washcloth maybe to help make them feel better, and we just pitch in as a team. Uh, and typically after a day or two, everybody's feeling good. I like pizza, that's one of my favorite foods. And on launch morning, we're allowed to carry a sandwich with us out to the launch pad. 
we just put it in a pocket in our spacesuit. And in case we're laying on our back for three or four hours before launch, if we get hungry, we have a sandwich there. So NASA lets us do that. On my third mission, I said, instead of a turkey sandwich, I said, how about a slice of pizza? Could you do that for me? And they said, yeah. So they made me this nice personal pepperoni pizza. I had it in my pocket and I was able to launch with it. I didn't eat it on the launch pad. I did that on purpose. I wanted to take it up to space and have the first pizza in space. So this was in April of 1997. We launched the very first pizza in space. It was pepperoni if it ever comes up at trivia night and it was pretty good up there. And one of my favorite experiments was a tank of baby jellyfish. And jellyfish, they squirt as they swim through the water. Everybody's seen that. And what baby jellyfish will do, they'll squirt to the top of their tank, they open their mouth, and with their mouth wide open in gravity, they fall and they feed. So they squirt to the top, open their mouth, and feed. Squirt to the top, open their mouth, and feed. In space, they would squirt to the top, open their mouth, and nothing would happen. They have their mouth open, Without gravity, they're not falling, there's no food coming in. And these little baby jellyfish had to learn new swimming behaviors just so that they could eat in space. And to watch a small animal like a, a baby jellyfish adapting to zero gravity was just fascinating because astronauts have to adapt to zero gravity and here we're, we're studying how other creatures do that as well. Yes, yeah, space is a, a great place for us to do research because we can do things up there that we can't here on Earth. And many of the experiments we do in space have benefits for us on Earth. We're trying to grow some new pharmaceutical drugs and engineer them, understand their crystal structure better so that we can manufacture these. And maybe in the future, you know, they'll be able to help cure cancer and other diseases. Uh, we also do a lot of experiments on the astronauts themselves. Astronauts lose our muscle strength. We lose our bone density in space. And we do a lot of studies on that. Uh, if we can understand how to minimize bone loss with the astronauts, maybe we can help our senior citizens, you know, people with osteoporosis, we can help them. And also with muscle loss too. We're doing more and more experiments trying to understand the mechanisms with that that may have a lot of benefit here on Earth. So these patches, this is from my second mission, it was STS-70. And what was unique about that flight, one week before our scheduled launch, a woodpecker attacked our big orange fuel tank. So some of the workers down at the Kennedy Space Center came up with this patch, and it shows our orange fuel tank, the top of it, and on top there's a woody woodpecker up there dancing, and at the bottom it says Kennedy Space Center Drill Team. It's not a normal drill team that you're, you think about. This is a woodpecker drill team. So that was a little bit of a joke patch that they came up with. When the woodpecker attacked the, the space shuttle, NASA had to figure out how to keep the woodpeckers from doing it again. And you can't shoot the woodpecker because it's a national wildlife refuge. We protect all the wildlife there. So NASA had to figure out how to scare the woodpeckers away to keep it from happening. And they formed a team of people. It was called the BIRD team, B-I-R-D. That's Bird Investigation, Review, and Deterrent Team. So NASA had a sense of humor coming up with that acronym. But that group of people decided, you know, figured out how can we make sure the woodpeckers never come back. And one of the ideas they came up with, they had these large beach balls and they had these giant eyes like you see here. And these are the eyes of a hawk or an eagle, which is a natural predator of a woodpecker. So by placing these all around the space shuttle, if a woodpecker came flying by, it would see the huge set of eyes and say, oh, there's a big owl a big hawk over there. I'm not going anywhere near that space shuttle and they were able to scare the woodpeckers off. This is from my last mission. This is a crew patch. So this is one that the crew gets to, to design for each of their flights. Uh, has our names of the astronauts. It was MSL, which is Microgravity Science Laboratory. It was a uh, science mission and we were doing a lot of combustion experiments looking at how fires burn in zero gravity, which is why you see that starburst pattern in the background. Here I have a patch, it's a Mach 25 patch. That's 25 times the speed of sound. And that turns out to be 17,500 miles an hour. That's the speed that we travel in space. 
So after your first mission, when you come back, they award you with the Mach 25 patch, meaning you have traveled 25 times the speed of sound. That's one of my favorites. And we're just a few short years from the very first woman setting foot on the moon. And for me, that, that's really exciting. The other thing I'm looking forward to is a little further out. About 20 years from now, we hope to land astronauts on the surface of Mars. And the astronauts going to Mars aren't this generation. I'm too old for that. In 20 years, I'll be 89, and there's no way they send me to Mars. The astronauts going to Mars are the young students that we have visiting here today. And that's a generation 20 years from now that will be the first to set foot on Mars. And we call them the Mars generation. And that's why I'm really excited to be here today, to be meeting your young students with their wide eyes and, and the sparkle in their eyes, just like I had when I was six years old. I see that same look in their eye here today. And I'm looking forward to them growing up and then maybe being that first person on Mars. A number of the students I saw today, I said, invite me to your launch. I want to be there for that. The Space Center here is just such a, plays such an important role in, in STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. For young students to come here and, and get inspired, get excited about uh, maybe going to space, going to the moon, going to Mars, or just being an engineer or scientist in the future. This is the critical role that the Space Center does here. I saw many young students here today, and they're all excited to be here, you know, looking at the rockets and the spacesuits. And, and just learning about space. They're really anxious to learn about it. And just that role of inspiration to get them ins inspired and to get them thinking about other careers you know, that they can be a part of in the future. That's a really valuable role here.